first thing is, I would like to ask everybody in this audience to clap if they believe what I say. Just for openers, you don't have to believe everything. Do you believe the creative will change the world? Yeah. Woo! Do you believe that the creative have the key to opportunities? That's cool. I do too. I also think that, see these red shoes? Either I qualify as someplace on the other side of the planet or maybe creative. <laughs> what I want to do is start with, how do you get creative? How do you push it? How do you elevate it? How do you keep it going so the fire is always hot? To me, creativity is the soul of the earth. As an architect, I am paid to dream. And I do a lot of dreaming, because as I get older, I get up every two hours at night, like some old, <laughs> and I get to start a new dream every two hours. <laughs> so my revenue should be really high. And Brian, I don't know, you're not that old yet, but this is going to happen to you for sure. <laughs> so our currency is creation. The creative is currency. That's how we think, that's how we work, that's how we make money. But I want to read something from uh, Aristotle. He said, when talents and world needs cross, you will know your vocation. Now, there's something to that. I think that's a smart one. So I think everybody in here should throw a net over the top of the world with social networking and technology. As we grow, we start out a firm that essentially we didn't have any communication outside except maybe through a fax. Now everything happens so quick, there's no time to respond. So throw the net. And I think that one thing that we can do is we can be ready, aim, smile. You know, I said ready, aim, fire. No, it's ready, aim, smile. A smile brings back a reaction that is dynamite. So that every time you look at somebody, if you sit there and smile, they're going to smile back. You're going to loosen the whole deal up. So what about having fun? In architecture, on the lower part of that slide, is a children's museum. Now, I did that so that I could make a sandcastle on State Street. You can imagine what the Historic Land Commission thought that was going to look like. But I said, this is not your building. It's a children's building. I want them to say, don't come in unless I invite you. It's about creating something that has a smile, that does something architecturally for a unit in the family, meaning the children. This can be a building of learning, a green roof, all of the monitoring of systems. It's a great building. But what I did was create a building that had a gaudy -esque tile base to it and then a sand tower on the corner. And then low windows for the children to look through and high windows for the adults. So we are honoring the fact that the children have a building of their own. On top is a building that we did that essentially has the same type of a, a rotunda in the center. And that means that there's a place to sit that has no hierarchy. And I believe in that. Being able to take people to a place where you can choose your seating and not be lined up against a wall is a very important thing. So as we look forward, go outside the box. Everybody in this room, this creative, can stand outside the box. This is an art gallery that we did that's on its side. It's next to an earthquake fault. The chimney sticks out one end. The windows are open on the roof. And I gave it to the earthquake god so he'd never shake the building and take the art. Now, when I got this approved, people thought I was nuts. But it turned out to be an award-winning building. And its sense of humor is fabulous. But it worked really great as a structure. So the more interesting you are, the more the inventive you are, the more you're going to be able to spread your wings and move. OK, probably one of the biggest moments in my life happened in the 1994-95 period, where I got a telephone call from Herb Kohler, Kohler Plumbing, who said, I know two crazy people. I know you and Roger Penske. I want to go to the Antarctic and climb a mountain. I went, whoa. I said, how are you training? Not training. So I said, whoa, I better go get McKinley and Rainier and do crevasse rescues, and I'm going to go train. And I did that. So I went on to the Antarctic. And the idea was to take an 88-year-old explorer by the name of Norman Vaughn to the top of a mountain that was named by Admiral Byrd for uh, Colonel, Colonel uh, Vaughn. It was in the center, 209 miles away from the South Pole. And I'd never done any ice work, and I'd never done any real exploring. But it, it turned into be something I need to spread my wings, because I just had a failure financially. And I felt if I could make myself to a point where I believed in who I was, I could extend myself in my own field. So I met the people on the ice, and we were there for four weeks. And if you've ever stayed in a tent at 10 to 20 below zero, 
keeping yourself warm as you're pinned down for three days by 70 knot winds. You basically use a Nalgene bottle to go pee pee in to put out your feet to warm your bag. So when, this is something when you go home tonight, if you want to do that, that's a way to keep warm. <laughs> you don't have to turn the heat on. Just think about that. Nalgene bottles and a little bit of getting up on your haunches. So <laughs> that, that was a phenomenal trip. But the big part of the trip, we got him to the top of the mountain. We were stuck on the ice for four weeks. Uh, we were down to 10 days in food. It was a hell of an expedition. On the way back, we were on a C-130, one of the big aircrafts, the military aircrafts. And we were coming out of Patriot Hills, which is a field flying back to Chile. And there was about 10 of us on this C-130. And two seats away from me was a gray-haired man. I didn't know who he was, so I sent my logbook around. He didn't sign it. I couldn't get anybody to sign for him. So finally, a, a Swiss turned down. He wrote something in German. And what he wrote in German was Operation Drumbeat. So when I came back to the United States, I bought this book. I was sitting two seats away from Commander Hardigan, who started the Second World War by sinking 20 ships in the New York Harbor, 300 on the East Coast, more carnage than Pearl Harbor, 5,000 dead seamen, and it was not uh, broadcasted to the United States because we were Admiral King was afraid to scare the people in the United States who were kind of not wanting to go to war at the moment. Well, it's Veterans Day. I thought I'd talk about this. So I got to know this man a little bit as we hit um, the, uh, the base camp coming home, and I read the book. The book's a phenomenal book, Operation Drumbeat. But for Veterans Day, that's a cool read. So as we look forward in the edge of discovery, I think all our architects and all creative people are on 24-7. You daydream, you nightdream. But essentially, you have to exercise yourself and go beyond your own limits. In running, we call it a, pay, a personal best. And in athletics, you keep pushing yourself beyond the limit so that you can get better and better. So you can go ahead and clear the cobwebs out of your mind. Because one of the things that we do, we get too stuck in what we do every day, and we need diversion. I think diversion creates creativity in the mind, more room to think, more room to do. So in these things up on the mountains, either at uh, Mount Rainier or down in the Antarctic, I really stretch myself beyond where I've been before. And it, to me, it was a great experience. So new ideas, big ideas. Um, float them, throw them out. And what's going to happen? Some of them will be too big and they'll explode. When Katrina, I watch television at night, I watch a lot of news. And I was watching Katrina and I kept saying, I can fix that. So I went and drew, and I created these um, peninsulas that had green washways in between. It, the peninsulas went higher than the levees, and we were able to create habitats and greenways in between these peninsulas, and I thought that it would save and rebuild all the wards in uh, Katrina and in New Orleans. So I went to Congress with it. Congress looked at it and said, hmm, see, the senator's being indicted. No, it's too big an idea. We're going to rebuild the seawalls. And I said, God, you know, you... There's global warming, I think. I think you're going to have problems again. He said, no, nope, too big an idea. Then I took it to Walter Isaacson, who a lot of you know because of the new book on Steve Jobs. And he lives in New Orleans. And he looked at it and he said, you know, I think that possibly the wards will take care of themselves. Another explosion of a big idea. And I probably have had 10 of those in my life where I thought that I was solving problems, but the world wouldn't go with me. So I flew left seat of an airplane for quite a while, but I was a horrible pilot because I would daydream all the time. I'd make things out of the cloud. And then center would come up with some communication, and I'd miss it, and the co-pilot, I always had a pilot next to me, and he basically would tell me, oh, 260, you know, or whatever, slow down to whatever. But the left was me in a plane looking at uh, clouds and making buildings out of it. On the right is a painting that I saw in New York that is probably one of the toughest paintings I've ever seen. First, it looked like a cloudscape, it was beautiful. The closer I got to it, it's a Brian Alford painting. It's an explosion of the challenger. When I looked at that painting at first, I thought it was beautiful. And then when you get closer to it, it scares the hell out of you. But I think you have to do that to yourself to get the cobwebs out. So most of you know an artist by the name of David Hockney. He did Mulholland Highway. So connecting the dots, connecting the dots from point to point is a very important thing in our minds as architects and as designers and as creative people. And what I did with that house on the lower right was create the the, the connection of dots in that red band that runs through the house by creating gardens on each end and destinations within that were surprises. You want mystic roots. If you're an architect, if you're a designer, if you're a painter, let people read paintings in mystic ways where they can get someplace they haven't been. 
Let them read below the surface and find new things. Keep it an intelligent move in a way of letting them know that there's something they haven't seen before that comes out because of your hand. Whatever you do, you can do something like that. In Japan, we had an office in Tokyo. And in Tokyo, um, I went to a tea ceremony one day. And I looked at the tea ceremony in the two pots in the sand, and I said, you know, I can do a building that looks like that. Rather than trying to do something that was US-based or Tudor or whatever they wanted, I did a teapot for the community building, which is up on the upper left. And it really related to what I was seeing. So when we transfer imagery and we start thinking about the fact that we can do things that has cultural ties to the area we're working in, whether it's literature, whether it's art, or whether it's architecture, this began to work. So at the Sydney Opera House, when I was looking at the Sydney Opera House, I started shooting pictures through the panes of glass, trying to make a painting out of the glass and the reflections of structure. So whenever you're walking with your eye or going someplace new, look at it as a painting, look at it as a new experience, begin to transfer your thoughts and make a building into a painting, a painting into a building, try to create something through the glass, be creative at all moments, keep challenging your mind and creating opportunities by your imagination. So then there came the day, the 9-11. 9-11, I was on an airplane taxiing off in Santa Barbara. And just as I started to rotate and get off the ground, we were called back to the terminal. We went back to the terminal, and they said to us, um, you're not flying. There's something going on, and we can't tell you. So I went upstairs in the terminal and went to the television set, and boom, you know, watched the planes go into the tower. So I went home and started painting, and I painted for a week. And what I painted was the paintings that were on the edge, and they were essentially the two towers beginning to disintegrate and a red flare of help going up in the center. I did a book on that that was a um, handmade book. It was published and went to a gallery for a while. Um, but it was trying to get rid of everything in my soul that hurt from that, that moment that I saw the television sets. And I had a poet who wrote to that book and did a phenomenal job. And uh, it's called The Day the Heart Exploded. And it was a real point of let's say, a moment in my life that was really important to great memories. Great memories, I'm not sure, but it was memories. So then we talk about never stopping. Never stopping. Um, we go back to Tom Watson at IBM, and he said, there'll never be more than five computers in the world. We go back and we look at the same time, they said, every computer will weigh a ton and a half or more. Leahy said, Admiral Leahy said, you'll never take an atom into an atomic bomb. Stop. You know, we can't stop. One thing creative people do is understand that you're never going to stop, that you keep going around the walls to the solution. Most researchers, as they're working, didn't start with the idea of getting one to point and discovering something. They found something else on the way, so not stopping. So this is a race I was in on the uh, Colorado River, and, or on the Arizona side, and I went, it's a 500 mile race, and I was going fast, and basically I stupidly got nervous and dumped the, tack, the gas tanks on the wrong side of the boat. So when I went around a pin, the boat had all the gas on one side and headed right for a hill that was about 35 feet high and buried about seven or eight feet of the boat in the, it was done. I mean, I went in and the helicopter shots, I think I'm holding part of my body down there because I think I hit it when I hit the wall. So the people that are coming down that bank saved me. They came down, pulled the boat out of the, out of the bank. I said, let's go, I want to start it. I started that boat. There was 125 boats in that race. I finished third. I lost 15 minutes in the dirt in that bank, but the boat still ran. So I didn't give up. So not giving up is a big part of the creative spirit and going forward. Because I think that all of us are going to hit walls. And in those walls are holes. There are ways to get around everything. So when you're creating a building or creating literature or music, you're going to find that there's always a new path that you don't see the first time you go. In 1984, I ran the Olympics in Santa Barbara up in Ojai. Um, I had never done it before. Peter Uberoff called with uh, Harry Usher and they said, would you go up to the lake and figure out how to do this? And we built the course. We managed the course. I was commissioner of rowing. I had 700 people reporting to me. I'd never done it before. But we asked ABC to go out in the water and put their cameras on a, uh, a, pont, uh, a Sponson boat and shoot back. And they did that. It cost them a million dollars to put in the fiber optics in the lake. But they opened the, the rowing every morning on television with Kurt Gowdy. So never having done it before, don't get scared. A billion, 300 million people watch me every day on that screen. I'd never done it before. 
I started there by getting my license to referee, to umpire, and to start rowing myself. I hadn't rowed before, but when Peter Uroff called, I decided, you know, got to do it. So part of your life is new experiences in creating places where you haven't gone, being able to do things that you haven't done before, that become things that clean out your cobweb, give you a wide spring of, of spread of your wings, and allow you really to become more than you were before you started the event. In conclusion, there were some things I wrote. Dream big, don't fail. That's what that explorer told me when I hit the ice. I was standing there looking over 200 miles of ice with an 88-year-old man who had gone to the South Pole for Admiral Byrd in 1929, and he just looked out over the ice, and I said, what do you see? And he says, dream big, don't fail. So that became kind of the mantra for that trip. And we cut steps up a 10,300-foot mountain and took him up that mountain. And he had tried three times, and we succeeded. And when we succeeded and bought him back, we flew into the uh, Patriot Hills base camp and then came back in the C-130 that I told you about. I think that great things occur when you walk outside the box. Never let anybody tell you that this is the box and you can't get out. Always think about how far you can take it. In architecture, what we try to do is rewrite the program. So somebody says, gee, two bedrooms, this and that. We come back and say, gee, we can do something much better than that. So always expand the program with your imagination. Make yourself valuable, not just as a draftsman or just a writer. Go beyond what they ask you to do. That's really important. That will spread your wings and let you become pretty important, I think. Listen, my dad told me when I was five years old, you never learn anything from hearing yourself talk. Listen. And that is exactly what you know, maybe I talk too much now, but basically I listened a whole bunch when I was young because he put his, he put his foot, the foot would go in my mouth, essentially, if I talk too much. So I learned that very early. Diversion, which I talked about. You will increase your ability to think by experience, by diverting your interest to points where you haven't been before, by exercising your brain beyond where you've been before, doing your personal best every time you hit the soil, every time you hit the water, whatever you're doing, don't be afraid to go anywhere. You'll fall down, but you'll find your way up, and you'll find your way doing new things. I'm down to 38 seconds. I did it. Thank you very much. <laughs> yeah. Thank you.